Hi, my name is Amy Wood. I'm with the Raymond A. Wood Foundation, and we are starting a series called Survivor Sessions, where we're talking um, about different topics related to uh, surviving hypothalamic pituitary brain tumors. And today we're talking about hypothalamic obesity and the holidays, which is a pretty tough time for caregivers and patients with hypothalamic obesity, typically. And then this year we're even experiencing a whole different world with the coronavirus situation. And so each part of the country right now and the world is affected differently. And so we're going to talk about all the things around um, this topic. And we're here with Marcy Sirota, who is a registered dietitian and also a hypothalamic obesity expert, both personally and professionally. Um, and so Marcy, welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. And I will see start off just uh, having you talk a little bit about your story and sharing your personal story and then how it transferred to your professional life. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and, and had been working at that for uh, about a decade when my son was diagnosed with a pituitary tumor called a craniopharyngioma and um, developed hypothalamic obesity shortly after uh, it was pretty aggressive. I mean, he gained about 150 pounds in, in, you know, about a six year period. And it took me a while to figure out how to manage it through diet, um, as well as medication. And it just kind of became <laughs> my specialty because I do it all day long at home. And uh, I was able to find a way for my son to eat that just minimized his food cravings and his hyperphagia and helped him be the healthiest that he can be, you know, with these issues. And so now my purpose has just sort of become to, to help other moms out there that are struggling like I was or parents, caretakers, or even adults that have HO um, to, to try to make the best of this condition and, and to try to teach them, you know, what's the the best, healthiest way to control it. What does that eating plan look like? So the simplest and um, most basic thing is getting rid of processed man-made foods and sugar. Getting them completely out of the house is the best thing that you can do. And learning to eat healthy, nature-made food. So food that either grew straight out of the earth and nobody's really changed it, or food that comes from an animal that has been changed very little. Like it doesn't matter if it was, you know, cured or smoked, <laughs> or, um, you know, you can even go so far as to say yogurt um, and cheese fall into that category, but just to stick with foods that didn't need to go to a factory to be created, something that you could either make in your own kitchen from the ingredients that nature gave us. Um, you know, and then the second best thing is to look at the carbohydrate intake. I mean, this is, in my experience, very much about insulin levels. People with HO have high insulin levels, and that causes us to feel hungry and to gain weight. And it causes us, our bodies, to be stubborn to weight loss. So the less carbohydrates you eat, the less insulin your body will be forced to produce. And then that is, in my experience, a way to promote weight loss with people with hypothalamic obesity. Holidays can be tough because we got food everywhere, right? So what are your thoughts, I mean, just on how to manage this yeah. situation? I mean, holidays are tough for most people, HO or not, because there's just this ubiquitous <laughs> sugar and candy and carbohydrates everywhere you go. I mean, whether you're at work and, you know, it's on the, the secretary's desk or you work in a hospital and it's at the nursing station and people are bringing things in all the time. It's, it's very difficult. And then you couple that with the fact that, you know, it gets dark anywhere between 4 and 6 p.m., depending on where you live. Uh, it's cold and people aren't really able to necessarily get out much and exercise, especially now with COVID when people in general aren't going to gyms. Uh, so it can be very, very, very difficult. And, um, 
You know, I have found that planning is is the best way to go about it. So, you know, you kind of have to figure out what are your holiday plans? So, you know, for those of you that are going to be celebrating with loved ones or maybe friends, um, you really need to make a plan going into it. I find the easiest thing to do is to host myself because if I'm hosting, then I have total control over what food is being served and what food is being brought over. And I'm just very honest with everybody, you know, it, they want to bring cake and this and that and the other. And I say, no, we're going to be having one dessert and I'm going to be providing the dessert. And then that way I have control. And what I'll do is I'll just make sure that I have one piece of dessert for everybody. And I don't have any more than that in my house. So there's no chance of anybody getting seconds. And I'll try to do something little because if you're going to sit down to a big holiday meal, you don't necessarily need like a huge dessert. I mean, even if it's just a couple chocolate covered strawberries or, um, I don't know, a mini ice cream sandwich <laughs> or something like that. It could be something more paleo style if, if you find that that works better for you. But um I find that, you know, having control over food is the easiest way. Now, if you're going to somebody else's house, I will always call and I will find out what food will you be serving? <laughs> I, I find out, is it going to be buffet style? Usually if you're going to somebody's house, you know, you're close with them enough to be able to ask these questions. And if not, you just explain, you know, we have to be very careful with my, my child or my spouse. Um, and it's helpful for us to kind of know what we're walking into. And then that way you can sit down uh, either with yourself or with your child and make a plan like, okay, there's going to be sweet potatoes, there's going to be Brussels sprouts, there's going to be ham, there's going to be turkey, there's going to be um, rolls, you know, you may have two carbohydrates, which two do you choose? And then you go over with them what that serving is going to look like, okay? So it's going to be about, and you get out a half a cup, it's gonna be about this size. And um, I find it's also helpful, you know, that when the meal is over, especially if you're hosting, you clear the table and you kind of end the meal rather than all the adults sitting around the table. No, food is over, you put everything away, maybe you, somebody, a teenager, takes all the kids into another room and gets them started on an activity, and then maybe dessert is promised within 30 minutes to an hour. Um, after that to kind of space it out. That's, that's what I find works for us. That brings up a really good point um, because I, we experience this personally. If we don't set actual times, if we're not really clear on when we're going to eat, when we're going to have dessert, that kind of thing, it creates a ton of drama a ton of drama and anxiety, absolutely. So those are things you either plan ahead of time or find out ahead of time. And uh, another thing that I've always done is I've always, you know, if I'm going to somebody else's house, I pack tons of non-starchy vegetables so that if my child is, you know, a lot of people with, especially children with HO, they will finish their meal very, very quickly. Everybody else is still eating and talking, right? And they, nobody, the kids haven't left the table yet. And the child's still sitting there. So that's when I pull out the non-starchy vegetables that they like to eat. Or even if it's, you know, um, healthy fats like avocados or olives or even some protein, just to be able to give them more food to eat that's not sugary and high in carbohydrates while everybody else is finishing their meal, I find that to be uh, very helpful as well. I also thought it was interesting. Um, it made me think of, of this buffet versus plate. Um, when you're hosting, or even if you are in a, you know, going to a family member's house that you're close enough to request that the meal be plated as opposed Absolutely. to. Absolutely. A plated out. meal is going to be much, much easier for everybody, really, because then, you know, it's everybody's eating less. And I think everybody ends up walking away feeling better. Um, but yes, having food sitting out, especially in the next room over, is going to be a big problem uh, if you have a child with HO because they're going to want to wander in there. And, you know, that, that then you're watching them rather than enjoying their meal. We have such an emotional relationship with food 
generally, and the holidays kind of bring up this emotional relationship with food. And one of the things that, you know, even just in our household, cookie baking was a big deal every year growing up in my family. And I don't cook, well, I don't cookie bake, well, we'll pick a cookie and we'll modify the recipe a lot of times to, to make sure it's less sugar, less carbs, but it's still a cookie and it still creates this drama for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's the kind of, well, Christmas is about baking cookies or, you know, celebrating the holidays is about eating this or that food. What are your thoughts on that? Like, are alternative recipes a good idea or, um, or, you know, sever that completely and find something you know, else to I make. think it depends on the family and it depends on, on, you know, I always think of the child because in my case, I have a child. And so that's the way I'm thinking of it. But, you know, the problem with baking is that you don't just bake one or two cookies, you bake 24 cookies. So if you choose to bake, um, you know, you got to make it real clear, like we're going to do this and this is going to be really fun. And you are going to be allowed to have two cookies or one, you know, if they're very small, like two, if they're like that size (laughs) and if they're that size one. Um, And then we are going to put the rest of these away and we're going to, you know, donate them or something. And I don't care if you end up throwing them away or if you want to take them to the police station. I mean, I, I'm so... I'm not sure how I feel about it because it's a nice thing to do, but at the same time, it's like, well, then they're dealing with all this extra sugar that they have a hard time resisting to, and it ends up making them unhealthy. So, um, you know, it's fine. I think there's other things you can bake too. You know, in the winter, we've got great winter squash. We've got, you know, you can do acorn squash and you can use cookie cutters and cut them into the shape of a star or a dreidel or a Christmas tree. And you can you know, put some oil on them and sprinkle um, cinnamon and nutmeg on them and bake those. And maybe you can even you know, put something on top of it when it gets out of the oven and it's hot, like maybe a, a small scoop of ricotta cheese or maybe um, you know, some type of, of cream even. Um, you know, you can make pumpkin soups, uh, which is really easy to do with canned pumpkin, butternut squash. So you can try to make different things. I even saw somebody post in, in our Facebook group about, um, instead of making a gingerbread house, they literally made a house out of vegetables. And then I think they used, I don't know if they use like cream cheese as the binding, as the, as the mortar to hold the bricks together, so to speak. Um, so there's, there's different things that you can do. Um, and it really, like I said, just depends on the family. But if, if you are going to be doing cookies, I would say, you know, you do a one-time cooking event, you, this is the rules. Everybody gets a certain amount and then the rest is going to Santa or wherever. It's a busy time. And it's an odd time because we're odd in a busy, we're busy in an odd way, probably not the typical way that most of us are used to going from party to party, but busy more in managing online school and our kids being home and work and all of that right now and the holiday stuff. So sometimes that makes it really hard to make a fully unprocessed Mm -hmm. um, meal because a lot of times now that we're, you know, we don't have our quick pull it out of the fridge and throw it in the microwave, kind of, we can't go that route. So what, what are your thoughts around that? Do you have any shortcuts you'd like to share? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a couple things you can do. Um, There are grocery stores like Central Market, Market Street, um, Wegmans, if you're up in the Northeast, that will do prepared foods and they have almost like a not a catering branch, but like you can order meals from them. And so what you could do is you could just either go to the prepared foods section of the grocery store and pick some things out and reheat that for dinner, which is perfectly fine. And it doesn't have to be, you know, perfectly a hundred percent. Like, yes, there's probably going to be maybe a little bit of sugar added in or something added in that you may not include when you're cooking, but you know what? 
when you're tired and you're running around and you're trying to manage online school, which is incredibly stressful, let those things go. You know, the higher the stress, I think the, the lower, um, not the lower the standards, but like you can give a little bit. You don't have to be so rigid. Um, and it's the same principle for, like I said, you know, well, you can have two carbohydrates at the holiday meal. Well, usually, you know, for those of you who know me, I say one carbohydrate at a meal, but it's the holidays. Be a little bit flexible. It's okay. It just explain that this is just something we do for holidays only. Um, and, and that's fine. I think some other things that you can do are when you do cook, you just make extra and then you freeze it for whatever day. I mean, in the there are foods that are freezable. Chili is very freezable. Um, soups are very freezable. You know, there's chicken and, and fish you can even freeze theoretically. I wouldn't freeze vegetables because they get, it breaks down the cell walls and it kind of makes them mushy. Um, but whenever I make a pot of chili, I make basically enough for two dinners and I freeze half of it. And then on the night, I don't feel like cooking or hope hopefully the morning I pull it out, put it in the fridge and thaw it out. Um, that's so that's yeah. another way you can go. And lastly, look, you know, we're all human. And if you're exhausted and didn't get a chance to plan ahead and you decide ordering a pizza just sounds amazing and, you know, is going to keep you sane, then go ahead and do it. Um, I might say like, okay, rather than ordering um, a chain food pizza place, order from, you know, the mom and pop pizza place that has thin crust and uses fresh, fresh mozzarella cheese if possible, sort of, you know, more high quality ingredients. Thin crust is always important um, because it's just going to be healthier, you know, and support those restaurants during this time too, rather than the big chain stores who, you know, are getting business anyway. They don't need as much support. And, and I think that that's perfectly fine to do, to, to order in dinner. And you know what? Maybe it's not exactly what you would have planned, but it's okay to do that once in a while. Because if you are able to, you know, meet your own needs of getting some rest and a little bit of a break, then you'll have more energy the next day maybe to, to focus on cooking a healthy, unprocessed meal. Great. That's all good. We actually do a grill day. So we pull a bunch of stuff out of the, the freezer and grill it all up in the beginning of the week and then eat it through the week. So that's been when. Absolutely. Yeah. Leftovers are great. In fact, on Sundays, I do Sunday night dinner and my house is clear out the fridge night. <laughs> so whatever leftovers are in there, whatever, you know, deli meats or whatever. I mean, we just make a dinner out of it and that's it. wanted to ask you um personally how's Jake doing um I know you you all have gotten to a really good place over the years I've watched this story um unfold and it's been really inspiring of of you know moving from a place where you, it was a real struggle for you guys and Jake and now moving to a place where he is it's much more manageable so yeah, tell us a little bit about that journey and then where you are today. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, Jake developed HO when he was three. Um, by the time he was nine, he weighed almost 180 pounds. And then over the next year, was able to lose a good 40 pounds through eating the way that I had described in, in the beginning of the, the podcast or, or the interview. And then um, we just kept his weight stable and he started to grow into it. And, you know, life has its ups and downs. So during that time, like, you know, things would happen. My husband suddenly was diagnosed with cancer. Well, you know what? Jake gained 20 pounds <laughs> because I was busy taking my husband to chemotherapy and he had surgery and I just wasn't able to do it all. But then once we got through it, I was able to kind of get back and we held his weight stable and then he grew into it even more. So, and then, you know, there's been other times where it's gone up and down for various reasons. Um, so I, you know, we've been doing really well. The, the diet helped, but I think what's been even, you know, just as helpful, and I think you have to kind of do it all, is we finally found a, a, a combination of medication that has really helped him manage his hyperphagia. 
um, and, and just bring it down a couple notches. I'd say from maybe, maybe it was at an eight, I'd say it's down to about maybe a three or a four, as long as we keep the sugar low and, you know, um, keep the flour almost down to nothing. And so, you know, everybody's different in the way they respond to medications and, and there's different medications um, that may work for some and not for others. But, you know, for him, we put him on oxytocin, naltrexone, um, and then strangely enough, he was put on topiramate and cannabidiol by his neurologist for seizure control. So it's a prescription grade cannabidiol, um, which is the part of the cannabis plant that doesn't contain any psychoactive, you know, THC. And when we added those two, it actually helped even more. Um, because, you know, topiramate is known to decrease appetite. Um, and the CBD is kind of a, I don't know, we're not really sure why it's helping, but it is, but it's in a very high dose that is not something you would necessarily be able to do through buying supplements. Um, you'd have to take so much of it. I mean, it would cost like thousands of dollars a month. So that's the drawback to it is that we're able to get it through insurance to treat his seizures. But for whatever reason, that combination worked really, really well for him. And then the other thing that, you know, is just so important is optimizing hormone replacement, making sure you're taking the lowest dose of hydrocortisone that your body needs to not go into adrenal crisis. Um, and then the other thing is, is, you know, being on a dose of Synthroid that's appropriate for your condition. And I work with a lot of clients that really have a hard time getting their endocrinologists to put them on a dose of Synthroid that's actually going to be helpful to them. And what I finally have realized is that the only way that they're going to listen is if you make a telemedicine health <laughs> appointment with somebody who is an endocrinologist that's an expert in hypothalamic obesity and get them to literally put in writing recommendations to your endocrinologist about where, how much Synthroid you should be getting. And um, your doctor will most likely listen to that, whereas they may not listen to me and they're not going to listen to you. So I think that that's something to consider because I think that you have to have sort of all three of those things in place. You have to have, you know, the diet, the medication and then the hormones uh, replaced optimally in order to have the best response to diet and exercise. To wrap it up, um, if people want to find out more or get in touch with you, I know you have a website. Um, so please share that information and any final thoughts you might have. Uh, yes, yeah, so my website is marcisarota.com, M-A-R-C-I, S like Sam, E-R-O-T-A, and I have a blog on there, and I have resources for hypothalamic obesity, um, you know, doctors that specialize in it, and I have, you can purchase my book on there. Um, I have PDF food plans if you want to just be able to print it out uh, from the book and hang it on the fridge, you know, for a couple dollars that you can buy. So um, those are all available on my website. And in terms of final thoughts, um, the other thing that I meant to say was, you know, if you do go to somebody's house for, for the holidays, a helpful thing to do is to have like a secret signal. So if your family member with HO is feeling overwhelmed, um, maybe a secret signal that says like, okay, it's time to go now. I need to leave. And you, maybe you just plan beforehand. Like if, if it's a child, one of the parents can stay with the other kids and the other parent takes the child home. And, you know, because I do think that especially children are going to have a short shelf life around all of this food. And also remember, um, you know, <laughs> I have seen many children without HO, when they are put in a situation where there's lots of sugar around and they are not allowed to eat it, but everyone else is, they all have meltdowns, even the kids without HO, okay? So just be prepared and keep your expectations realistic 
that, you know, something's going to come up that you haven't planned for. Someone's going to bring a dessert <laughs> that wasn't, you know, told to you just to be nice. Um, and that, you know, you can always sort of make a bargain like, well, you know what, you had your dessert we planned on. So I'm not going to be able to let you eat this other dessert right now, but we can take it home and you can have it next Saturday for your weekly dessert or, you know, oh, you want to have seconds or thirds. Well, we're not going to do that right now, but I'm going to take this home for you and you can eat it tonight for dinner or you can eat it tomorrow for lunch. And that's yeah. the two other really good um, strategies that we've used to just kind of de-escalate a situation that um, could otherwise go bad very quickly. If everyone's not on board as a family, it makes it really hard on the parents. It does. It makes are, it very yeah. hard. And, and, you know, I would just say know your family. And if you know that your family or the friend that invited you over is not going to be understanding, then maybe you duck out and you say, you know what, we were invited somewhere else this year. Or we're just going to do it this year because of COVID. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are some people that you can't change. And, and yes, I mean, I always, especially being a dietitian, I'm very sensitive to that where I always, you know, feel like people just who don't really understand HO think that I'm crazy and that I'm so controlling. And, you know, they just see this snapshot. They don't see what goes on. And, and the analogy I like to make maybe to help somebody understand, because you can't understand it unless you live it. But, you know, when your children are young and if you don't put them to bed by eight o'clock, they're a disaster the next day and they're crying and they're fussy and they're whining and everybody has a really bad day. It's kind of like that. It's not about, oh, the cookie, the extra cookie. It's not the, you know, it's not the calories or the extra carb in that moment moment that's going to, of course, you know, you know, we can all eat an extra carb every now and then, and it's not going to hurt anything. It's the behaviors that it triggers later when you get home and they're raiding the refrigerator because their hyperphagia is now in overdrive. And so that's the issue. Um, and so maybe just to kind of use that analogy and explain it that way is that, you know, um, this is the only way we have found that it doesn't make the next couple days really hellish for us. Um, True. Yeah. To manage this. So, you know, can't judge yeah. a person until you've walked many moons in their moccasins. Thank you so much for your knowledge and wisdom around this situation and um, in joining us today. And again, it's marcysarota.com. And um, happy holidays and happy good luck holidays. the next couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. <all> <laughs> Everybody hang in there. It'll be over soon. <laughs>